Hello, this is Scott Weinberg. Uh, welcome to the It Follows Critics Audio Commentary. Um, if you've listened to the commentary that we did for Snowpiercer, uh, you'll have an idea of what this is all about. And if you didn't, you should grab that Blu-ray because Snowpiercer is a wonderful film. Again, my name is Scott Weinberg. I am a film critic for uh, Nerdist.com and a UK VOD site called The Horror Show. I also do some writing and uh, editing for tons of movie sites. I've been doing this for about 15 years, and I am very flattered and pleased to be bringing you uh, this commentary. Uh, I think this is a very special, interesting horror film, and um, I just had oral surgery less than 24 hours ago, and I'm still here, so you will might hear in my voice that I sound a little rubber-lipped, but let's move on anyway. We open with uh, one of several truly beautiful uh, Steadicam tracking shots in the film. Uh, what their significance means is, of course, up to the individual viewer. Um, but what's interesting to me is when you have these uh, clear and uh, lovely slow pan uh, tracking shots and they actually feed into the story and they're not just showy for showy's sake. And you'll see that happen several times in this film um, in which uh, cinematographer Mike Julakis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Mike. Mike Gulakis or Julakis. Uh, all I know is that you did some great work in this film, sir. This is It Follows. And if you've read a lot or even a few of my uh, horror film reviews, you might realize that, uh, or you might remember that I, I often say that originality is overrated in the horror genre. I think that um, a lot of times you can take something old and make it very interesting with just a little amount of effort. Uh, haunted house movies, barely original. Um, slasher movies, not very original. Uh, monster movies, not much new there. But if you can bring um, uh, just a little bit of uh, a, a, a new voice or a flavor or an angle or humor, um, any kind of new touch, and a horror fan might be likely to give your movie a, a shot. Um, now, having said all that, It Follows is remarkably original and it is incredibly refreshing to see a horror film where you don't have to say, oh, well, yeah, it's just, you know, they go out in the woods, and, but it's good anyway. This is a unique uh, horror film, um, and to those who watch a lot of horror films, you know, that in and of itself makes it unique. It Follows was written and directed by a gentleman named David Robert Mitchell who um, astute film geeks will remember his 2010 feature debut, which was called The Myth of the American Sleepover. And it is not a horror film. It does have some uh, similarities to this film in uh, tone and style and attitude, but it is uh, obviously a bit lighter than this film is. But if you've not seen Myth of the American Sleepover, uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, and I highly... <laughs> uh, Look forward to whatever Mr. Mitchell comes up with next, uh, because it's clear that he has taken, uh, for his second feature, he has taken a wide array of influences um, and still um, made a unique film. This is not a uh, necessarily a, uh, David, a John Carpenter homage, although, oh wait, here's a beautiful shot right here. Oh, God, I love that. It's very disturbing. Makes you wonder exactly how that demise went down, but again, uh, that's Mike Giulakis and his wonderful cinematography. Um, I guess it's probably only right to run through the cast real quick because it is a, a small but very impressive ensemble. Um, as you'll meet uh, in just a minute, our lead actor is a wonderful woman named Micah Monroe, whom you might recognize from The Guest, which came out last year and is also quite good, and she is very good in it. And... Um, M many of the reviews of this film have made a uh, special note of how fantastic her performance is. And I would echo those sentiments uh, without a strong lead, uh, without a strong actor in this performance, in this character, you, your movie's just, you know, it, it suffers a lot uh, because you have a potentially outlandish premise. And uh, without this setup that takes place in a hyper real but very realistic world, and without a performance like Miss Monroe's um, film would not work nearly as well. Uh, we'll meet some of her co-stars in a few minutes, uh, and uh, in a bit we'll be calling up a, a handful of 
my colleagues to talk to them about their favorite aspects of the film. Uh, my thoughts on the general thematic heft package of this film, there's a lot to dig through in this film. Um, and I like to say for a movie like this, it's as deep as you want it to be. If, if you'd rather appreciate It Follows as a surface level nightmare chiller, uh, about kids who are being stalked by something that they don't understand, it works on that surface level. But if you choose to delve even a little deeper into the uh, into the story, into the themes and the subtext, there is a whole bunch of interesting stuff going on in this film. Um, so uh, some films require you to uh, take that leap and really take a huge bite, and either you, you have to take the whole package or nothing. Uh, and what's fun about this movie is that it, it really can be as deep or as simple as you want it to be. Um, another issue uh, that I like a lot about this film is that um, when you have a smart film and, an, and a film that dabbles or, or deals in ambiguity, uh, what happens is it incites a lot of thought and conversation. There's, you know, we could all love... Um, Cabin in the Woods is a is a great, fun popcorn horror movie. Uh, but once you're done talking about the moments and the performances and the color of it, you know, that's pretty much it. It's That's it. This is a film that, you know, uh, three people could watch. One of them could not even like it that much. Two of them could love it. And they could talk for a few hours about, you know, what's going on beneath the surface. And uh, it's always nice to have a film that will provoke that sort of chat among friends where it's not just like yeah that was fun done um but uh, now who we're meeting here uh the girl uh, sitting on the couch right there is uh that is jay's sister kelly and she is played by a young actress named lily seep s-e-p-e -E, hope i'm pronouncing that right she doesn't have a lot of credits at present but i expect that to change she's quite good it's a understated but very important role kelly um the uh, young man on the couch is Keir Gilchrist, who uh, you might have seen recently in Dark Summer. Uh, quite good, very clearly good at playing uh, gawky and awkward. Uh, I suspect that'll change as he gets a bit older. He's a very good actor. Um, and the, uh, the the third girl, uh, her the girl reading the little uh, clamshell e-reader, that is Olivia Lucardi, or Luchardi, not certain, who plays Yara. Uh, who is a very interesting character, and we'll, we'll get into her a little bit later, too. Um, what you'll notice about the film is that it could take place um, at any time. Aside from the model of the cars that we see, um, Yara's little e-reader thingy, uh, there are very few... A uh, cell phone at the beginning that Annie had before she died. There are very few touchstones or very few points to modern, the modern era uh, in the film. So it, it was shot completely in Detroit so to those who know Detroit clearly the film takes place there uh, but as to when uh, that that's up to you it kind of takes place maybe in a, uh, a a dream logic that exists in like a uh, I don't know a, um, a cross section of what everything they know their youth and their you know young adulthood combined at once uh, but it does have that kind of mysterious, almost David Lynchian, where and when does this take place? Uh, and eventually you, you realize that it doesn't really matter. It's just part of the amusing, like, nightmare logic of the film. Uh, this gentleman here, who plays Hugh, uh, who is um, Jay's boyfriend, uh, his name is Jake Weary. Also, very good performance here, because as, as it comes up later, uh, what you'll see is that it would be really easy for this guy to just be a one-note bastard because uh, he does some pretty shitty things. But as you see in this scene and in two later scenes, he's particularly good at bringing a little bit of decency to a guy who does some terrible, awful things. Uh, and that's Jake Weary, recently seen in Zombievers, which is an actual film and is kind of a funny film about zombie beavers. Uh, we could, uh, at any point in the film, take a moment to just appreciate the production design uh, and the art direction, okay. um, just and the costumes, everything that you're looking at besides human beings, okay. <laughs> the buildings, the props, the clothes, everything, uh, evokes to me, um, you know, a late 70s or early 80s kind of 
uh, wood paneling Radio Shack era, that kind of vibe, uh, to, to another viewer. It might look like the late 80s or mid 90s. And uh, again, therein lies the beauty of, you know, ambiguity is, you know, we will all pull something different out of the film. Another theme that I think runs through this film that is very interesting is, uh, as you realize that, you know, uh, I'm sure you've seen the film by now, at least I hope so, that's what they always say, and I'd be foolish to ever watch a commentary before the film, um, but as you know the plot by now, what I like, uh, or at least one of my interpretations of it, is that it, it almost feels like these characters are have an unconscious, primal urge to stay young. The film is almost as if they're they're fighting against in, the encroaching Where? specter or the encroaching immediacy of adulthood and maturity. Mm -hmm. And without knowing it, they're doing, you know, the, what, what the it represents to me is like that, that mysterious fear of once I'm thrown into the deep end of the adult pool, I'm lost. I, I'm on my own. Um, uh, obviously, the film touches on a lot of uh, sexual issues, and, and it, we'll get to that again with one of our guests in a bit. Um, I kind of save some of the more juicier topics for um, for my guests because they're mostly smarter than I am. Um, and another thing that I really like about the film is it you'll see it throughout the, mostly the first act as things get crazy. And as we, and we meet, when we meet Greg, who's a friend who lives across the street, is the really clever and subtle way that Mr. Mitchell sets up his character development is you get within 15 minutes um, that, that Jay and uh, Paul and Yara and Hugh and eventually, uh, not Hugh so much, uh, but that there is a, a long kinship there as if they'd been living across the street from each other for years and they've had their ups and downs and maybe their families don't get along but it has that vibe of of uh, being a teenager and still being friends with those kids that we grew up with even though we're all growing into very weird and different and strange people uh, our proximity and our history um, makes us friends not necessarily by choice just because by circumstance that's where you live those are the friends you have and uh, maybe they're not always the best people <laughs> and again you know the film is about a, um, a a specter an evil presence that is passed along from person to person through sexual intercourse now of course the uh, interpretation of a sexually transmitted disease is right there it's really not that difficult to extrapolate that meaning and again don't ever get the impression that there is one meaning or one answer to a, a film or any piece of art because there is not. Your interpretation might be completely different than mine or David Robert Mitchell's, and so you know everybody's right. It's all it's all art. But since uh, sex is in many ways the first true adult act. Um, you know, it's not voting, and it's not having a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. No, it's not driving. It's not going into the army. Generally speaking, losing your virginity is the first act of adulthood, and um, your biological adulthood. And then the the film kind of leads into that. Um, that they infect one another with this encroaching fear or this encroaching uh, presence, this inevitable. Um, specter shadow of adulthood uh, it sounds like I'm just rambling but I, I really do think I'm making I have a point here I just don't know if I'm making it articulately <laughs> um, but uh, you know there's more to it than just you know the trope in old slasher films is sex equals death and on the most surface level this movie kind of plays with that trope but it goes a whole lot deeper than that and here's where we see uh What's really interesting here is how we go from Hugh's a nice guy at this point. We like him. He seems like a sweet boyfriend to her, right? Uh, and how insidiously and how quickly uh, somebody can go from a lover that you trust, uh, which you'll see in a few minutes um, when they get together, to what happens after that, uh, which you know 
we won't jump the gun on what that, but he turns from a, a, a good, sweet boyfriend to a who are you, almost a stranger, to an absolute villain uh, over the course of this sequence right here and, and the one that follows. And um, I suppose now might be a, a good time for us to get our first guest on the line. So let, let's do that, and uh, we'll talk over this sex scene with our friend Eric Snyder. Okay, we are now um, on the phone with Eric D. Snyder of uh, Movie BS with his partner Jeff Bayer. And Eric, good to have you, buddy. Hey, it's good to be had. Uh, why don't you, uh, we talked about this quick, briefly yesterday, um, and as you know, we're joining the film right now as uh, Hugh and Jay are about to have sex in the back of the car, and uh I know that one of the things that you wanted to talk about uh, was the look of the film, the production design and the cinematography. I touched on that briefly, but uh, why don't you give me a few points on, on what, what you like most about those things? Yeah, and of course, I wasn't listening to your part, um, and I never will, so, so that's fair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like that the, the, you know, the film starts with that, that uh, slow uh, pan as the girl, uh, Annie, I think is her name, mm -hmm. uh, running around. She's terrified. And uh, I like that because it sets the tone. The camera, the camera always, the whole mo movie moves slowly when it moves at all. Um, and it's all, often we're, uh, we're often following behind people, which obviously makes obvious sense thematically, or we're sort of creeping up on them, or we're looking at them from a distance, or we're just sitting still, just staring. And the whole thing gives us this vibe of uh, that we are, we're, we're in no hurry. That we're content to just sit here and see what happens, and which is like which is like the monster, the the, the it. Uh, it's going to catch you, and it's not even going to break a sweat. It is not worried about catching up with you. There's nothing frantic or uh, or fast at all about the way the movie looks, uh, which to me is very unsettling. Like to me, that that's even creepier. Like a thing that's chasing me that I'm running from, that's scary. But a thing that's not even going to run to get me because mm. it's so sure that it'll get me eventually anyway. That that's more unsettling. What do you think that the um, the very deliberate and cinematography style? What do you what do you think that adds to the you know the the slow burn suspense or paranoia nature of the of the story? Uh, it because I think because it's so calm, um, it uh, to me as I was as I was watching the movie again, uh, it makes me feel. Because my mind is telling me I should be. Uh, this is scary. There's a thing after after us. Uh, this is deadly. But what I'm seeing is so calm and and, uh, and cool about it. Um, and like I said, that, that seems to me that's that's in some ways scarier. And I think that uh, like the way that uh, the camera will often do a, a 360 uh, pan all the way around. Um, there's there's the one the one shot when they're at the school. Mm -hmm. Where the camera is panning around, and we see what we think probably must be it out there, out the window, coming toward us, and the camera doesn't stop. The camera just keeps going. Yep. Yeah. At that point, we're we're already in the director's hands. We're we're already playing the game, and and the the 360 angles. And I think you'd agree. What's fun about that is once you're sucked into the premise, that 360 is what the characters should be doing with their head. Like, right, you know, like every single time she is standing somewhere, you're like, I'd be constantly spinning in circles looking and like, and so I think in a way, the, several of those very calm, cool 360 shots are kind of setting the stage for, okay, right now, at this moment, they're safe. It's, it's kind of, it, you know, it's giving us a brief respite of, because we just showed you 360 and there's nothing here. Now it's safe, but it won't be in 10 minutes. Um, yeah, and that and that one in the school where we see what we assume is it through the window, and then the camera goes around, and it's going all the way around, and we think, oh, we're going to come back around to the window and see where it is now, but we don't. We stop before we get back to the window. Yep. And it's, and and it's like going, no, no, keep going. I want to see what happened. Oh, they don't know what the, they don't know what danger they're in. They don't they don't know that it's out there. Right. We're already, uh, you know, the film does a a brilliant job of getting you into the premise and into the shoes of the main characters very quickly. Um, because, and I think the reason that it's so good at that is because the, the premise is, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's simple. You give somebody a simple rule. Don't get them wet after midnight. People like that. You know, it's simple. And the rule is it will not stop. You can't escape it. You can only run. And one of the most obvious subtextual themes there is that's death. We're all walking away from death. We are all, it's following all of us. 
Um, and you can you can run and you can hide, or you can not run and not hide. It doesn't matter. Eventually, we'll get to uh, Yeah, and again, you know that, and compared with the uh, you know the the demon as an STD, again, those are kind of first level subtextual themes, but they're enough to make the film unique. And then it goes, you know, it works on even deeper levels than that if you're if you're willing to look for it. Yeah, there are, there are many things in life that are inevitable, uh, and I think that's. That word inevitable is what keeps coming back to me as what makes the movie uh, so haunting is the inevitability uh, of it catching up with you. And then there's no way to get away from it, whether that's death or, yeah, the consequences of your of your actions or whatever. Um, they're just consequences you can't get away from. That's just how life is. And it's scary. Life is scary, Scott. You know what? Life is scary. It, it took me 90 minutes to get into the city today, and it normally takes about 20 um, you know, uh, we joke about this movie being like a pro-abstinence message or whatever, uh, and, and that's funny, But and I don't want to be a hipster about this, but I actually was terrified of sex long before I saw this movie. Yeah, I think we all were. I didn't need this. Yeah, we don't need you, David Robert Mitchell, making us more afraid of sex. Um, but what, 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 what can you say um, about, like, for example, right now, as we're watching the scene where Jay is being, you know, swung around this, um, this abandoned building uh, by Hugh, and she's, she's strapped down uh, in a bra in a very vulnerable visual state uh, while he's explaining to her the rules. And to me, this sequence feels like somebody is taking a young woman, or it, could, it doesn't have to be a woman, but taking a young person aside and saying, this is what adulthood is. Deal with it. You know, like, it's, it's just not going to stop, and you have to accept it. And you're not gonna, and you're not gonna believe me until you learn for yourself. If I just tell you what works, you've got to see this and learn for yourself, which is also a, a, a life lesson kind of a thing. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, that whole that first moment where he, after they've done it in the car, and then he comes around and chloroforms her. That like that, that's where the movie for me uh, grabbed me, and I said, oh my goodness, I don't know what's gonna happen here. Right, and it, and it turns out, and it turns out to be, <laughs> it turns out to be terrifying uh, in a different way. Like we think. You know, what's this guy's deal? Is he a bad guy? And then he's not. Um, but, uh, yeah, it turns out to be sort of a false scare. See, now we're back. We're back with, uh, with Kelly and uh, Paul and Yara on the, on the, um, on the porch. Yeah. She's reading her, her, uh, her harbingers, her little fortune tellers. Little seashell Kindle. Yeah, uh, and she's into the whole tarot thing and, and predicting the future, you know, and... Um, again, I'm struck by the fact that if these three didn't grow up right next to each other, they probably would not be friends. But there, there seems to be an, an, like a, a very old kinship there, like a very loyal friendship that, that only comes from proximity. It doesn't really come from the way, like, I chose you to be my friend, Eric. Yeah, and we, and we, we get that later where, uh, where Paul and Jay talk about their past, and then we get that they grew up together, and they kissed even when they were little kids and all that. And, yeah, they used to come and hang around at their house. Uh, and that, that helps in a couple of ways. Uh, like you say, that kinship is, is long established. Uh, and it also means, from a practical standpoint, we never have to see them call each other on the phone because they all live apparently on the same street or something, okay? yeah. uh, which which helps uh, with the whole what time period is this set in thing. Yeah. Nobody has cell phones, but nobody really needs them either because they're all either always together or yeah. they walk across the street. It's around, always you know? the big question in horror films is, oh, how do you write out that we don't deal with cell phones? Well, do what this guy did and just make them not pertinent. That's <laughs> they just... Yeah, there's uh, Annie in the very first sequence has yeah. one, and then after that, we never see another cell phone. And uh... see, and now this scene here, when she she gets she comes out of Hugh's car and stumbles onto this, to me is like she right there has spread like the the ugliness or the ugly side of being an adult, of being a new adult, of being mature, is now spilled out on on the lawn in front of these guys who are you know basically in the last stage of being children. They're all, Paul, they're basically just, you know, end-stage children. And uh, so as soon as they, as soon as you see that, you know, your big sister or your friend just gets, you know, dumped onto the lawn. Looking like, looking like she's been raped. Yeah. Like that's got to be what they first think. That's yeah. what it looks like. Yeah, it's a stark and horrifying thing. We Now, we, we don't know it now, but that's Greg and his mother watching from across the street. And, and that leads to, just leads back to that 
like that sense of history in that neighborhood, which is yeah, that, fam- that family has trouble or whatever, whatever. With very little effort, right, Eric? With very little effort, we we get the idea there might be bad blood there. Maybe Greg's mom doesn't approve of these kids. They they talk later about how they read dirty magazines on Greg's lawn, and and it's just that that subtle but strong little quilt, that foundation of of of, of short speak of 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 you know like. They just know each other. Yeah, shared history, and it, and it establishes sort of that that uh, that sense of community, and that these characters all know each other and have for a long time. And it, and what makes it what makes it feel more uh, authentic and lived in, like it's not a movie world; it's sort of like the real real world. And yet, also, it's got this sort of dreamy, uh, out of time thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the film often it often kind of looks. Not misty, but sort of, sort of uh, overcast. It sort of yeah. just has this dreamlike feel to it, and that coupled with the slow camera movements, which is very dreamlike, and then sort of the nightmare logic of this thing that pursues you, uh, it all it somehow is both realistic and a nightmare. The whole thing, and that's a very yeah. yep. surreal. Uh, uh, way to make a movie, and I think it's very effective. That's a good way. That's a good point. A good way to put it, because if uh, in, in a lot of cases, if you make your film too too uh, if you put your foot too far into the nightmare realm, you risk losing people because we still need a plot and we still need characters that we are interested in and care about. So uh, being able to balance a quote-unquote traditional narrative in that here are the, pl- here are the characters, here's the uh, obstacle they have to overcome, and, uh, you know, oh, here comes a great jump scare while she's in the bathroom and the ball hits the... Oh, the ball in the window. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love this scene and hate it at the same time. Uh, <laughs> It gets, I've seen the movie three times, and it gets me every time. And it's disturbing, too, on, 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 a, on a mature level, too, because she's, like, studying herself. Uh, and we're wondering, beyond the normal young female issues, what is she studying exactly? Um, what is it she's contemplating at that moment when the ball hits the window? It's just eerie. Um, and it doesn't need to be explained. Not everything has to be underlined and explained. It's just little touches here and there. You get the little boys who are constantly peeping on her. There's no, there's no traditional payoff for that, except yeah, it's just yeah, it's one of those things that that happens. And that, yeah, the whole movie is about being is sort of being followed and the eyes are on you. And uh, I wonder, uh, I wonder how different it would be if the main character uh, were a boy instead of a girl. Obviously, yeah. the, the, the demon or whatever uh, doesn't discriminate. No. It happens to be a girl that, that gets it in this case. But I, you know, because women, uh, uh, young women have such different sexual issues from what men have. And the politics there are entirely different. And the yeah. stigma is different. Totally. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. It totally plays into it, yeah. It le- and to me, that leads into, you know, the, the idea that the, these little boys are always peeping on her. And I'm getting the idea that, again, I'm a man, but I'm what I'm extrapolating from those moments are... Last year, two years ago, she was just one of the kids in the neighborhood. Now she's home from college, and she's a woman. And all the little boys and all the young and, and her young her sister's friend, they're all all of a sudden staring at her like she's a woman, and she's either learning to appreciate that or learning to not like it. Um, but it it adds a sensation of discomfort. Not 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 that she's uncomfortable, but that that moment is uncomfortable. Right, and it all kind of comes from uh, kind of, kind of comes from sex. She's yeah, she's thinking about what has happened to her and the changes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, we're at your moment now, where she's a a great moment in the film where we've all seen that scene uh, in a horror film where a ha- a very conveniently placed college professor will basically spell out the entire theme and subtext of the film in a lecture. Uh, John Carpenter does it very cleverly in Halloween, and I believe this this sequence here is a somewhat of an homage to that, uh, where she looks out the window and sees the old woman coming along. Yeah. And, and of course, Nightmare on Elm Street, and dozens. You watch a horror movie, uh, you're likely to see a scene in which a teacher just talks about death or fate. <laughs> right, yeah, that's, that's pretty standard, pretty standard. Uh, it's a good screenwriting trick. And yeah, it you know, works. You do it right. And here is a moment. I'm sorry, you go. I was just going to say that here is where Disaster Pieces score really starts to kick in for the first time. Uh, but but the music, the music in this movie is terrific. Everybody who uh, my next four guests, we're all going to talk about the music. Disaster Piece, aka Mark Vreeland. This is his first film as a composer. Okay. 
And right now we're getting those little psycho stings. Oh, I love it. So if I get, it, it sounds like the 80s, which has to the, the whole vibe of it. And the, yeah, yeah the real sport. the real talent in in combining stuff that you love, the real hard part is making it come out sounding like something unique. And anybody could say, hey, doesn't this sound like Carpenter? Doesn't this sound like Goblin? Doesn't this sound like a score I love? But to actually make it sound like Carpenter and still make it your own is, that's real talent. I, that's, you know, that's just not just emulating. That's real skill. Yeah, um, you know what, you know what the, the, the effect with the difference, the vagueness of the time period, uh, what it feels like, it makes the movie feel like it's set in the present and yet somehow also when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Both it's, at the same time. Yeah, what's really, yeah. And, and I'm going to let you go, Eric, but I think what's cool about this film is that you can watch it and feel like nostalgic, but then also feel like a grown-up kind of not judging, but watching these kids at the same time. Yeah, and being and just being afraid. For them. Great. Eric, thank you so much for participating. You can find Eric uh, on Twitter at Eric D. Snyder. And uh, if you ask him politely, he'll tell you where to find all his film reviews. You don't have to ask politely. You can be rude and I'll tell you. Just be rude. I didn't go back yeah, to totally. Thank you, brother. Have a good day. Thank God. Okay, we're back now with a new guest, a female one. That was Eric Snyder. Now we got Brittany Hayes, an old friend of mine who writes for Screen Crush, huge horror geek, and then she's going to have some very cool insights about It Follows. Hey, Britt. Hello. So we, uh, uh, we're at the point in the film uh, at which uh, Jay had just seen the old lady on the campus, and she bolted, and uh, now we're in, the, uh, we're in, the, uh, in this storeroom where they're... Uh, he, Paul says, I want to st stay the night. No. And Kelly, Jay's little sister, what does she say immediately? What does she say? No. She says, no, very casually and offhand. He says, why don't I stay the night to try and help protect you guys? And Kelly, the little sister, says, uh, no, immediately. And uh, I know that one of your favorite aspects of the film is the, uh, the, the young womanhood, the deflowering, the sexual politics. So why don't you go, uh, just go off and, and tell us what you like most about that. Yeah, um, I mean, I really think it's interesting that they don't let they don't want Paul to spend the night. I mean, because he's perceived as such a sort of like nebbish, mm -hmm. wussy kind of dude, mm -hmm. and um, but also, you know, like they don't want to feel like they're letting a man protect them or dictate what they're doing, which I think really plays into those sort of sexual politics and gender dynamics in the movie, and. I think it's smart that it doesn't try to make one gender um, deferential to another or more powerful than another. Everything is very equalized. That's a good point. Do you, do you think that part of the reason they don't want Paul there is because they know he's just deep down a horn dog who wants him? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that's part of it. I mean, everybody knows, obviously, that he has feelings for Jay. Um, I think that they don't really want him there. I mean, I think it's very complex, yeah. obviously. I mean, the whole film is very layered, but it's just like, you know, yeah, he wants to hook up with her. He has feelings for her. But also there's this, like, crazy thing going on that's sexually related. Yeah. And he's trying to put himself in that position. I don't know. It's this weird thing of, like, him trying to do something valiant, I think. And I think in his mind he thinks that sleeping with her puts that, you know, poltergeist onto him. And he thinks that that's like, it's like this white knight thing. That's, that's, that's kind of one of the, yeah, I agree. That's one of the themes that I got from it, which is he, uh, he kind of has that ducky mentality of I'll do whatever they need from me because I'm their loyal guy friend. And eventually I'll get paid off in sex. Mm -hmm. And it's both is noble and kind of pathetic at the same time. Because he does care. He's not just about getting laid. He really cares about them. But... It's well-meaning, though, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not... But that's some of the worst, like... I mean, it's not, like, aggressive sexism. It's very, like, unwitting sexism. Mm. And it's just that... It's, like, ignorance. And so he, he means well, and he wants to help, and he wants to do these things, but he doesn't really realize that that very act, however well-meaning it is, is just this, like, white knight insult. Like, right. I will take care of you. I will take this. I will shoulder this. I will do this because I am, okay. you know, I am supportive of my female friends, and it's just, like, having to prove, like, how feminist you are right. and how good of a guy you are 
Right, it's funny. It's trying. It's what he's doing. I love it. It's kind of like he's trying to be masculine and one of the girls at the same time, which is, yeah, I'll be a, I'll be a man. I'll defend you. But on the other hand, I'm sensitive and I really do care. Uh, no, but it's kind of cute though because he is like the only guy. Yeah. With all these girls. It's such a well-written role, and Keir Gilchrist, I think, does such a great job because he's not just creepy and weird. There's a little side of him where you're like, dude, we can all sense it, we'll pull it back a notch. But he's not leering over their underwear, and he's not gross about it. He's kind of no. sweet, like you said. He is sweet. Yeah, he is sweet. I mean, he, like I said, he's very complex. Like All the characters and all of the motivations and all of the actions are very complex, which I, I enjoy a lot. And I really like him, too. I think he's a great actor. I've loved him for a long time. Um, so I was really happy to see him in this. Yeah, I think this might be his best. His oh, he will be. I mentioned that earlier. I think we'll be seeing him in a, in a lot of things. I uh, just saw him in Dark Summer recently, and uh, that's an interesting movie. And he's great in that as well. Uh, and yeah, it's it's tough when you're you know he's. I suspect that like he's gonna f- specialize in kind of like the dorky best friend guy, and then in like within three or four years we're gonna look at him on the newspaper or online and be like turned into like super stud. He won't, and he'll never play nerd again. He'll always, he'll be like Patrick Dempsey one day, you know? Yeah, he'll, he'll have like a Neville Longbottom situation. Yep. Oh, yeah, we'll be like, hey, remember when he was that cool dork? Well, look at him now. Uh, but uh, I love this scene between, this long scene on the couch between him and Jay, uh, because it's like they're trying to reconcile their entire history. And, yeah. And it's predicated on this weird occurrence, because like the shoe hasn't really dropped yet. Uh, they're they're kind of just playing along with her fear, and uh, I love this bit where he goes in because this is where the audience has to keep up, because he comes back from the kitchen and says I didn't see anything, and the audience goes Oh cool he didn't see anything. Then we wait four seconds and go Oh wait he wouldn't see anything only she would. We're still getting the rules down in our head, and that's why I think the screenplay is so clever because Mitchell knows we're still getting the rules down in our head. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it, it really does establish the rules quite nicely. But I like, I think the thing I like the most is the actual, like, sexual, sexually transmitted disease allegory. I mean, it's like, it's so obvious, mm-hmm. but it's not, it's not heavy handed and it's not hitting you over the head with it. But I like this idea that's sort of eerie. And it's just this, it's an idea that I think we all deal with every day. I mean, from the time you first go to sex ed class and you're like, gym teacher who always ended up teaching it tells you you know like every time you have sex with somebody unprotected you're having sex with everyone that person's had sex with everyone those people have had sex with it's infinite yep and that is such on its own without even a ghost that is such like an unnerving and sort of awe-inspiring concept yeah it's like what because once you have become an adult and in this film once you're once you've had sex you're an adult uh once you've entered that adult world you're out of this suburban bubble that they live in, and now you've let somebody into you, or you've been in someone, and now all bets are off. Like, you're, you're an adult now. You don't have that bubble anymore. You're, everything you do may, may have repercussions. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's also, it's not even just about sex, too. I think it's also a really smart and sweet metaphor for feelings, and I think that you see that with Paul, and that's where he comes in with the emotional side of it. It's not just sex. No. It is, you know, it's letting those feelings in and all of the baggage that comes with those feelings. So it's not just having sex with somebody and everyone they've had sex with, but having an emotional connection with somebody who's had all these emotional connections with other people who have had emotional connections with other people. And it's, I think, also just about the baggage that we take with us. Yeah, it's and not sex. It's that intimacy. We so that baggage. In intimacy, not so much sex, it's just as being intimate, you know, like being vulnerable and opening yourself up to somebody else. Once you do that, you feel completely. Uh, vulnerable. You could be hurt at any moment once you open yourself up to somebody. Um, yeah. Uh, and again, you know, the, the great thing about the, like you said, it's not deep, that idea that, oh, it's a sexually transmitted creature. Uh, but it's that's far from the only, you know, that's like the surface level subtext. If you want to go stop there, you can stop there and do an entire art, uh, an entire essay on just the sexual politics. You could go it even further and further than that and just, you know, human nature of friendship and loyalty and, you know, where you where they grew up together um right now we're coming up to my favorite my favorite bit in the whole movie which is when they let yara in the door and then the big tall it is behind her 
Uh, oh God, that's so creepy. How? I mean, what, what's what's great though to me is I watch, and I know you do too. I watch a lot of horror movies, and a lot of directors and, and producers seem to think that wait, 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 suspense, bang, that's a scare. That's the only kind of scare there is. But you know what? A really weird tall person in a really small place who shouldn't be there and is walking towards you, that's scary too. There's like really weird, subtle things that are scary that not a lot of people try to even put into film. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things too. Is that one, I think that there's something better about building dread and it's something that James Wan does in a different way, but that this film also does is that it builds a sense of dread, and that's scarier than anything that suddenly pops out at you. It's that dread that you're living in, and it's like making your skin crawl, and it's just knowing something's about to happen. That's scarier than any, like, jump scare or anything. Like, I think that there are a few directors who are very good at that. And then the other thing, I think, is that what this film does really well, and I think we've seen this with other horror films like The Babadook and stuff in the past year, what they're getting right is that they're creating something that's so intimately relatable and it's something that we can all empathize with it's something that we've all experienced it's something that could happen to any of us um and it's heightening that in a way in a fictional sense but it's that relatability that makes it so scary it's that intimacy that we have with that subject matter that makes it so scary like we've all had sex like we've all i mean well most of us but like we all um we've all kind of experienced this and like the sort of fear of like did i contract something or or also that intimacy and sharing yourself with somebody and all the baggage that comes along with that um and that's i think what really makes it scary is just the the recognition of what we've all experienced right but now we're watching jay this is a, a to me this is a really fascinating scene because she's terrified out of her house and she has to get away from the creature uh and where does she go she goes to, um, to a playground yeah, yeah, that's right. She goes to a playground, which is really sweet, and I like what that says because mm-hmm. um, it's very much like they're torn between being adults and being teenagers, so it's, you know, effectively still being children. And when you have sex, like you mentioned earlier, I mean, that's sort of when you become an adult, no matter what age you are. Um, there's something very adult about that act. Yeah, the the fact that she goes to a, uh, I'm sorry, I don't. You, I was just going to underline what you said. The fact that she goes to a uh, to a, a, a playground is kind of spa- sad. It's bittersweet. You know, you're like, oh, that poor girl. <laughs> she wants to be a little girl again in this moment. She just wants to be a safe little kid on the swing set at this moment. But I'm sorry, you were going to yeah, say. Yeah, no, and I think that, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that it also really speaks to that certain time in your life when you have sex and then all that baggage comes with it and all these feelings and fear and you know repercussions that may occur and you just want to retreat back and like go back in time to the moment before you made that decision and the moment before she made that decision she was still a little girl and I think she's just so scared that she's regressing like she's just trying to cling to her innocence like what little is left of it and Mm -hmm. she feels so torn and that is just it's so sweet to me I mean that can like when you pair that with the opening where she's like in the pool Um, and she's just so, like, innocent and dreamy, and she's, like, googly-eyed over the boy, and it's just, it's, like, heartbreaking. Mm. See, and what what, what gets her out of the swing set is her friends, uh, we have a series of moments where uh, we're meant to think that the creature might evolve, uh, come out of the shadows at any moment, but instead, uh, her friends come out of the shadows, and she's legitimately relieved that they came after her. Um, And then one of my favorite moments in the film is when Greg comes up, because we don't really know Greg very much at this point. Uh, we only kind of know him as a face across the street, and they all see him, and she says, do you see that? And they all say, I do, which says they now believe her. Yeah. Unconsciously or not, they now believe her. And when Greg says, I'm going to get the car, and we, as in, as the viewer, this is the first time we have any experience with Greg. But the fact that they're all like, hey, dude, what's up? And they decide to get into his car. That is, to me, some of the most efficient and effective character development you'll ever find. It is tells you instantly they've known this guy for years and he's their friend and they trust him. Yeah. No, there's very there's this really smart uh, shorthand. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't spend a lot of time 
introducing people and explaining like how they know each other. I mean, they have this very natural way of speaking with each other that you can just tell immediately, like, oh, they've been friends forever. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to wrap up. We're going to move over to my friend and yours, Sam D. Zimmerman. But if there's anything about the film or any message you'd like to send out to the viewers, uh, feel free, Britt. Um, no, I think I'm good. Have fun talking to Sam. He's one of the best people. Yeah, Sam's great. And, oh, yeah, I wanted to make sure every single participant said at least one sentence on the Disaster Peace score. Oh, it's so beautiful. I mean, that is such an amazing synthy score. I'm so happy that we're in a time with horror films that were doing these, like, throwback synth scores. And yeah. they're very, like, jarring. I don't know. It's so cool. It is. It is beautiful. I And it's not something you want to listen to late at night. But it is a beautiful, ominous score. I, I love it to death. Thank you so much, Britt. See you soon. Thank you. Now on the phone, we have a good friend of mine, Samuel D. Zimmerman, formerly of Fangoria, presently the editor-in-chief of Shock Till You, Till you Drop. Sam, maybe you could say that website better than I can. Shock Till You Drop. Damn, there you go. Like a badass. Right now, we are... We are uh, about four, about an hour into the film. We are uh, one of maybe one of my favorite shots in the whole film. They've just gotten out of Greg's car, and all five of them are approaching Hugh's house, and they're all kind of in a different part of the frame, and it's just a beautiful shot. They're all wearing different clothes. Let's real quick, let's talk about what's your favorite thing about this movie, Sam? My favorite thing about this movie? Yep. Uh, you know, it's a lot of things. I think my favorite thing about this movie is there's not just kind of one thing that's my favorite thing about it. I think this film is really rich. I think it's really rich visually. I think it's really rich thematically. Um, I think everyone in it does a really beautiful job to watch. It's a wonderful film to watch, both in a cinematography sense and also in what the actors are doing, just like that, that frame you mentioned where they're all kind of entering the house and everyone's in a different part of the frame. Everyone's kind of in their own little headspace and moment trying to figure out what's going on here. I love it. Yeah. Uh, when I talked to you yesterday and uh, I tried to divvy up some topics so that we all, none of us would kind of cover the same topic, I asked you what were your favorite aspects of the film. And one of the first things you said was Yara and her tarot cards. Yes. Well, Yara just kind of in general, uh, I think is a really wonderful aspect in the film. I think she's really funny. Um, very kind of darkly funny and slyly funny. She's echoing a lot of the things that are going on in the film with her uh, her little clamshell e-reader. Uh, the cards, too, in the beginning, are, you, you mean the cards they're playing outside of the house, right? Yeah. So I, I, I went to see the film again to watch it on a big screen, and one of the things I love about that is part of the... Part of my idea about a lot of how the how it materializes, especially in relation to Jay, is is people obviously who it knows you can get close to you by you know whether it's her father yeah. or uh, her grandfather or not, but also some of the women it materializes that I believe are kind of these different ideas of how she could end up these different um, facets of suburban existence. So you know she yeah. sees this kind of lonely old woman, these potential futures these potential futures that she's trying to avoid, right? Um, and obviously it shows up as Yara at one point, but also when they're playing these cards, you see these little things like the old me. You also see a little kind of uh, bikey Bessie, and, you know, obviously very soon after there's that shot of Jay uh, riding her bike away. Yep. So I love that just as a little kind of set decoration foreshadowing. Almost as if Yara knows what's going on before they do. It's just something you could you could extrapolate that thematically if you wanted to. Um, oh, of course. Uh, but I mean, you could extrapolate so much with Yara, especially with what she's reading, and even kind of what the teacher is reading out loud when Jay's in class. A yeah. lot of it is about growing old. A lot of it is about accepting death and how we accept death. Yeah, and, and a lot of the a lot of the um the, the a lot of the first interpretations of the film, uh, and and maybe the most interesting, Britt and I just talked about it is you know the idea of a sexually transmitted uh, specter. Um, and the idea to me, though, is that it goes beyond that. It's not that they're, they're, they're infected by having sex. It's that now you've had sex, you're almost an adult, and you don't want to be. Exactly. I think, I think sex is, is less a monster or a villain in this movie than adulthood is, and, and sex is basically kind of, I think, our culture's barrier to adulthood. You know, we judge people's maturity, their age, you know, by if they can handle sex, if they can handle sexual topics. Um, and... With this film specifically, I think adulthood is where the real 
kind of evil is. Uh, so much of what Jay talks about, especially when she's laying in the car, is is when she was a child and how she envisioned being older and where she would go. And she gets all of that, you know, like you is you is attractive. They go to this beautiful movie palace where there's an usher playing the organ. They're about to watch charade. It's like every ideal version of that date. They go into a beautiful forest. They're hanging out. But still, you know, she's kind of like, where do we go now? What do I do now? And I just think the film is about that, especially in relation to the suburbs and and adulthood in the suburbs, because I feel like the suburbs is portrayed as this in-between. There's that great shot of Yu's car where, you know, right behind it is this urban decay, Mm -hmm. and right next to it is this forest, and the forest is this kind of rural folklore legend kind of evil place, and the horrors, and I think what it is transmitted through sex is this convergence of both, where, you know, it's an urban legend, yes, but at the same time, it's it carries the weight and the evils of, of what we associate with the city, which is kind of sexual, you know. Yeah, sinful, right. What What's your take? Um, obviously, uh, you and I write for horror sites. We're kind of scholars in the genre, in a way. What uh, what, what horror films? What, what 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 filmmakers or films do you see, uh, at least partially? Because it follows is remarkably original, which is one of its most uh, refreshing aspects. But it's clearly inspired by other things as well. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, I think a lot of people make the Carpenter callback because because of his use of frame, which is really, you know, obviously, it, it, it's a reference to Carpenter in a way. But I think it also just uh, highlights how good of a filmmaker David Robert Mitchell is because Carpenter, you knew how to use a frame. He was yep. a great filmmaker yep. working in horror, which is which is wonderful. And so David Robert Mitchell does the same thing. He knows how to fill out the frame. You can see that with them, just with their bodies, but also with kind of how our eyes have to search the frame and find it. Mm. Another thing that I like about it that a horror geek would probably appreciate is that it's almost um, a teenage, it's almost an adult free world in a way. It's like the teenagers kind of say, like, do they? It's all about them, and they kind of maybe save the day, and they never at any point run to an authority figure for help. No, it's, it's, I feel like it's very Elm Street in that way, um, which also I think Elm Street hit some of the things that this does in the kind of middle-class existence. Is a lot of horror films that deal with teens now, mm-hmm. you see houses that you can't really imagine ever living in for mm-hmm. a lot of people or most of the audience. Um, which I don't necessarily mind. I don't think realism is all that important, but I think when it's tactile like this, like with Jay's screen door, is kind of rickety. She has an above ground pool. She lives in a world that we're like, oh, that's the suburbs I know. I don't know. The, yes, the upper, exactly. Upper tier. It's a hyper reality kind of movie suburbs that we all recognize, even if we, you know, like, because there's sh- establishing shots of the neighborhood in the, early in the film. Like, I grew up in a middle, middle class neighborhood that looked nothing like that, and yet, those moments still evoke my childhood to me. Oh, totally, because it's, it's a hyper-reality that, that we can touch in, in a class-level way, mm-hmm. not in a way... Like, there's a hyper-reality for, for films like... I don't know, I'm just throwing this out there, but something like Ouija, which came out last year, which felt like it was, you know, these are, these are upper-tier middle-class. Yeah. You know, these are houses that I've never seen or, or I've only seen from afar. Yeah. Um, I think Jay and Yara and Kelly and Greg all live in houses that we, you know, our friends have had. Yep, I can smell the wood paneling right now. Uh, another thing that I, I that I think that I like about the film that uh, I think speaks to the writer is that like one night now we're watching the scene where Hugh has them all on his backyard and he's explore out on the field and he's explaining to them the, the the demon the the creature and in most films they just want to beat the shit out of him for what he did and that'd be the end of it that'd be the whole scene like you messed with my friend Jay come here. But, like, they're not even really angry. They're all speaking very calmly and matter-of-factly, especially when you consider what he did to her was really vile. <laughs> well, that's what's kind of funny about the film is, is even though adulthood is the kind of ultimate dead end, they're all remarkably mature in the way they kind of deal with each other. It's almost like they realize that the stakes and their friendships are all more important than whatever the kind of pettiness is. We spoke about this yesterday when, when Jay tells Greg, um, when Jay tells Paul that she slept with Greg in high school, A, it's very matter-of-fact, which I love, which makes me 
kind of reiterate the fact that sex isn't the villain in this film, mm -hmm. and it's kind of sex positive in that way. She just shakes it off because it is something that happened, and it's part of their shared history and no one else's. But also, you know, Paul knows what else is at stake here. He's not going to be a, a weenie about it. Yeah, any like, other movie. You, the fact that they don't have... Paul flip out at that moment when he finds out that she slept with Greg. When when they don't have him flip out and make a big stink, I just went, oh, thank you. Because that is what you expect from, good or bad, any movie. He's the character who exists to get jealous and angry and then killed. And they don't do that here. <laughs> it's very clear throughout the film that Kelly also has a thing for Greg. Yeah. I mean, she has eyes all over him, and they never really... You know, they never do, you know, the jealous sister thing or the conflict. Everyone here realizes what's important, and I really appreciate that about the film because we also, I mean, you and I see so many movies in a genre where the skeptical character is such a stock character, and it's so frustrating to see because at a certain point, in any, in any of these situations, no matter how outlandish or otherworldly, you have to say, you have to either give the person you love the benefit of the doubt or realize what's going on, and and it follows. Everyone is very hip to that. Yeah, if we were pretty, if we had this film would go to a different st major studio or something, all, that's all the notes that you would get. All the notes would say, "Do they believe her or not?" And you know what? It doesn't matter if they believe her or not. They're there. They're they're supporting her. They're driving her in Greg's car around to the, the now they're in the they've just arrived at the lake house. Like maybe they think she's nuts, or maybe they think she's totally. Maybe she, they, she, they believe her, but it doesn't matter. She still needs their help, whether they believe she's insane or not. And and all the time they spend not doing those things, yeah. they also they spend kind of being li like living an authentic existence, the way kind of kids are with each other, the way they speak to each other, the way they can even kind of shake off dangerous situations and, and, and appreciate a couple of hours at the beach like they're about to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, real quick, of anybody, of anybody that we have on this commentary, I would have to throw it to you. Uh, let's talk real quick about the contributions of the uh, legendary Bob Kurtzman. Oh man, I mean, they're they're really terrific in in the way that I think similar to how we were talking about the suburbs is it's, it's both supernatural, but it's also tactile. I mean, the way some of these characters appear, they're they're frightening, they're gross, but in a in a way that you know, the girl in the kitchen. Yeah. She's monstrous in a very tragic way. Yes, in a, yeah, in a very matter-of-fact, upsetting way, not in a, wow, look how crazy this demon girl is. Look at all these crazy la latex. Because a guy like Bob Kurtzman, uh, to listeners who might not know, uh, I believe Night of the Creeps was his first film in 86, and since then, the guy with his partners has worked on literally hundreds of horror television movies and TV shows. And he is a brilliant latex magician. He does makeup and makeup effects and creature heads and bodies and legs and you name it. Bob Kurtzman can make it for a movie. And what's great about his creations in this film, and like you said, it ties into Mr. Mitchell's marching orders, which are subtle, less is more. You know, like, you know, a guy like Bob Kurtzman, in most times he'd be like, look at my crazy monster, it's covered with blood, look how awesome it is. And we'd linger on it for eight seconds to like appreciate how cool that monster is. But that's not this movie, Sam. And he, and he, and he very smartly kind of highlights, especially the people, especially the people that we recognize that become it. So right yeah. now they're on the beach, and in a couple of minutes they're going to be in this beach house, and one of the it's is going to be one of the kids is constantly watching Jay. Yep. And when it's it, his eyes pop, and and it's because he's such a voyeur with Jay with his budding sexuality. Yeah, yeah, and and it's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna go through and, and break down what each uh, uh, creature or what uh, which each version is. But if you really look carefully, uh, there's a reason that earlier in the film, Hugh says it twice that it can look like anyone. Uh, I, I'll be completely honest, Sam. The first time I saw the film, I didn't catch it once that it was a character. Uh, but there are at least five or six times. Yeah, at least five or six times in the film, the it creature is a character, uh, and we'll you know leave that to the viewer to appreciate. Uh, another beautiful shot: uh, Paul in the foreground as Yara floats by in the background on the uh, on the on the uh, because Mitchell shows us every character in this scene, and our brain is saying, "Wait, there's five of them. Where's Yara? Where's Yara?" They say, show her in the water, and then bam, she's right behind Jay as well. So which one is it? 
You know, it's a, and it's funny because when, I mean he allows for these really lo- wonderful little breaks of humor, like when you ask if uh, if everyone sees the girl walking towards them, and even in that, because you know, you kind of have a sense that that there's something not right about the Yara that's approaching from behind. Yep. And when Yara floats by, it's both a confirming that you're fear, but it's also just it's so funny how casual she is. Yeah, and uh, we saw this was it was it played Fantastic Fest is where we saw it last year. And that moment when the second Yara comes up behind Jay, you this shows you how astute the viewers are at in, in, at Austin Film Geeks are amazingly astute. They didn't they caught that instantaneously. You it was like a tornado hit the movie theater where everybody went. Oh, oh, oh. It was a beautiful moment to see this. If you can see this with a crowd, try to, because. Uh, for a quiet, calm, cerebral horror film, it plays like gangbusters in certain moments. Uh, oh, absolutely. And one of the other things, um, if it's cool, I wanted to touch on. Oh, yeah. When you asked about uh, film uh, filmmakers and, and films this film kind of recalls on, I, I remember after having seen the film, a lot of the way people describe it, and it's super canny, they'll be like, it's a nightmare on Elm Street meets the ring. And, and I love that description because it's so canny. I mean, who's not like, oh, I want to see that. But I recently revisited the ring and it, it's so much deeper on that, how, how much these two films are companions. Uh, the ring is very much coming at the fear of death and the fear of a stuck existence, but from the side of an adulthood where you're already mm-hmm. regretful of the way you spent that time. And I think watching these two films back to back is, is really rewarding and kind of beautiful. I, I had new appreciation for both of them. That's really interesting. I, I, I see both DNA of The Ring and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street in this, uh, and I would definitely uh, give The Ring a second shot on that. But uh, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Will, will this, will, will it follows be remembered uh, as well as those two films? Do you think? I don't care about box office call. I don't care about how many copies it sells or how many tickets it made. Uh, what I'm saying is, do you think in 20 years, guys like you and I, uh, but younger, will say, "Yo, yo, you gotta see it followed"? I think so. I think it's already at a point where it's breaking through, where it's not just it's not just us that are, are telling people to see oh, it yeah. follows because something like the Babadook. Uh, which I love to death and was my favorite movie of last year, didn't break through on the level that It Follows is breaking through. Mm-hmm. I remember telling a lot of people to see The Babadook and not a lot of people saw The Babadook. This is a film that people are aware of, that people are seeing, and that's as much as what you need. You need, you know, dudes and ladies like us who 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 are seeing these films and are telling people to see them, but you also need, like, when I, when I see a film that's from, you know, the late 60s, 70s, and... It's an obscure film, but still my mom and my dad, who aren't huge movie geeks, go, oh, I remember that. That's going to be something like this, as people who aren't huge movie geeks are getting out and seeing this film. So in 15, 20 years, when kids are rediscovering it and they say it, someone's parent is going to be like, oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And it's just as simple as you come up, I mean, we make it sound simple. It's obviously a lot harder, but the simple formula is you get a good idea and, you know, work it through to its best possible finish, you know, because the, whether you like this film or not, you can't say that it's uh, a knockoff or a, oh, found footage is hot right now, which uh, zombies are hot right now. Uh, it's not any of those things. It's its it's its own creature, whether it makes a nickel or it makes $25 million, it's still of, of inestimable value to me because it is unique. It's unique, and it, it, even even the things that we recognize from other places are unique. Um, Disaster Pieces score, which is incredible. Everyone, you know, can very again cannily say it's Carpenter-like, it's Howarth-like, it's synth-like, but it has its own very recognizable cues. It's not just the synth. It's not just the yeah, kind of pounding. Yeah drum these cues are memorable and beautiful in themselves one thing i'm gonna let you go after this one tell me if i'm nuts but after watching the film last night again um does the score remind you of phantasm i you know i don't know because i haven't oh the score yeah i mean i think i honestly believe that the score is a combination of of mark freeland's brilliant mind and 12 or 15 different influences and i'm certain that Don Coscarelli's Phantasm uh, score is is a is a key a huge influence on this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I, I, 
Phantasm is, is another film that is very singular and so unique. And yeah, it, good, it, yep. it's this total oddball thing that I feel like to have that DNA is entirely feasible. Yeah, they do have a similar, I mean, clearly It Follows is not as bizarre as Phantom, Phantasm, but they do have a lot in common. You're right. They're both strikingly original, and you're either in or you're out. You know, from the first crazy moment of these two movies, you're in or you're out. And... Oh, yeah, this movie announces itself. Yeah. Because the 360, following her around in the 90, in the heels, I mean, this film announces itself in a very particular way. All right. Well, Sam, we're going to let you go just as uh, we see Greg gives a kind of a come-hither glance to Jay in the uh, hospital room. We know what's going to happen now. And, uh, again, if you want to find Sam, tell them where they find you on Twitter, Sam. Uh, you can read me at Sam D. Zimmerman on Twitter, or you can find me every day at Shock Till You Drop. Right. Oh, and I didn't, uh, I forgot to ask Britt. Uh, you can find Britt on Twitter at Miss Britt with two T's, Hayes, Miss Britt Hayes. And you can find her at Screen Crush, of course. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to have uh, all you guys on this track with me for the uh, for posterity for this movie. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Talk to you soon, brother. Later. And we are back with our fourth guest. This is uh, Allison Anastasi from Flavorwire, formerly uh, of Cinematical, where we used to work together. And uh, I knew that when I was doing a horror film, uh, she was one of the people I definitely wanted to have on the commentary. Allison, welcome. Thank you. Uh, right now, we are on the scene where Greg and Jay are in the hospital room making whoopee. <laughs> and uh, this might be a good time for us to, uh, when we talked yesterday, I said, what are some of your most interesting topics? What are the things that interest you the most about the film? And you said one of the, uh, to- one of the aspects of the film that most fascinated you was that of voyeurism. And since we're now watching a couple um, have sex, simulated sex, I figure voyeurism is a good topic. <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, the way the, the way that the sex scenes are shot in the film, uh, they're always shot in a distance, um, through a car window or through a hospital window like they are right now. And it's a very, um, they're almost anti-sensational in a way, but um, it, it feels like a dollhouse diorama that we're looking inside of. Um, and the film immediately, you know, the, the camera establishes itself as a voyeur. Um, when we first meet Jay, we're kind of peering through some trees and looking at her inside the pool, you know, swimming around. And, you know, from there, it just, it's always about watching or being watched. Although I think what it follows, it's more about looking for something rather than looking at something. One of the uh, interpret, and I'd love to hear yours, but one of the interpretations that I got from the neighborhood boys peeking at her in the uh, bath, uh, in the swimming pool, and then again, peeking at her in the bathroom Mm -hmm. One of the uh, angles that I got from that uh, was that last time she was there, she was basically still a girl. Now she's back home after a year or or a semester at college, and she's feeling even maybe even unconsciously uh, self-conscious of being a full-born, full-blown woman now. Um, and, And maybe like noticing that boys are leering at her is something that you notice when you first become a woman, you know, that kind of thing. That's the that's my now, but I'd much rather hear your interpretation of that. <laughs> I think it just speaks to the film theme about teenage anxiety about sex and and um, the confusion of of you know this kind of growth. And um, I think that um, you know we we watch her during these really intimate moments, and yeah, she's always being watched. The camera is this voyeur again, and the boys peeking over the the fence inside the pool. Um, so, uh, do you think that it, it's the kind of thing where she uh, uh, does she appreciate it, or does she feel uncomfortable? Um, I think she feels uncomfortable in her own skin. I mean, yeah. if, if you think about it, she even uses a name that's sort of genderless. Yep. You know, when we see the mom at the table talking to the neighbor, you know, they reference her as Jamie, but she calls herself Jay. Yep. She chooses a genderless name, and everybody else does too, as well. Yeah. It's well. It's been well established among these kids that she is Jay. Period. There's not even like jokes about it. Um, one of the things I've, that my favorite aspects of the film, and we could talk about this in relation to the the sexual politics of it, is that there is such an established history between these kids. Right now, we're watching Greg talk to the younger kids who are sitting on the stoop, and they're like, "How's Jay? How's Jay? Yeah, have you seen anything? No." And he he leaves. So he's not exactly their tight friend, but I. 
think it's fascinating that there's no weirdness there. They all know he just had sex with her, and it's they're all just casual about it. It's not, you know, go ahead. I think it's, um, you know, this is their family. It's that moment like when you're that age as a teenager and you're becoming an adult and your friends are really your family. Um, it also kind of um, is reinforced because we never really see the mom fully in the film. Um, she's always sort of hidden or or not really present. She almost feels like this living dead kind of wandering the house. Um, so the, the, you know, this is the tight-knit group of friends, and when they go to the beach house, that's definitely their time to band together as a family for the first time, even though, you know, they might not all know each other very well. Let's talk a bit about the, the role of the parents. Uh, aside, like you said, from Jay's mother in a few moments and Greg's mother from across the street, we don't see much of parents at all. And in, in a lot of films, it's kind of there's the subtext of if parents had done a better job, this kind of stuff wouldn't happen. But that's not a theme in this movie at all. Right. Um, you know, this is about, you know, the selfhood and realizing selfhood and, and you know, who these people have. They're becoming people. They're becoming yeah. their own person. Yeah. And like most horror films, we don't ever really see the parents or the parents are always kind of useless. And um, that's he sort of plays off of that in the film really nicely, I think. Yeah, I would. I don't think that I would really like a scene in which um, Jay tries to explain to her mother everything that's going on, and her mother says, "Oh, are you on drugs? Oh, get in your room. Oh, you kids, what are you on?" Like, I, I'm glad the film doesn't have that moment because every horror movie has that moment. Exactly. Yeah, and um, I think that um, you know, even when we we get very close to kind of hearing more of Jay's backstory. Um, there's that nice shot where the where she's sitting at the table talking to the neighbor after the whole situation with Hugh slash Jeff happened, mm-hmm. and the camera goes right over her head. We don't even really get to you know involve them at all, even visually, very much. Um, so I you, like the way he handled that. Very. If much. you had to pick a year, obviously there's no correct answer, but if you had to pick a year in which this film takes place, what would you say? I don't think I could, really. <laughs> you really can't. Because <laughs> you want to say, like, 1982 until you realize, like, you know, the, the few little, the cars and the e-reader uh, and the cell phone that Annie has. It's just, it's something that keeps sticking through my head. And it's certainly not something that, uh, you know, hurts your uh, appreciation of the film. If anything, it makes the film more mysterious and interesting. Um, yeah, I sort of see it, like, in this dream world, too, because of the different objects, you know, all the the cars or the compact um, e-reader thing that uh, Yara is reading. You can't really tell, and it it's such, has such dream logic to it. Um, in many ways, it almost is reminiscent of that sort of Nightmare on Elm Street kind of vibe. Yeah, Sam said the same thing, that it does... Uh... It comes into the when it comes into the, the the children becoming adults and coming into their own and and being forced to take care of themselves and fix their own problem, uh, is kind of one of the themes here that a lot of slasher type movies touch on but don't really care much about, and this is kind of like, parents you wouldn't discuss this stuff with your parents, you wouldn't exactly. Uh, and speaking of parents, right now we're watching uh, Greg get kind of effed to death by the it follows posing as his own mother. Uh, yeah, so, it's definitely one of the creepier scenes, I think. Uh, do people get that? Do people grasp that, that, that that's who the demon is at that point? I didn't until last night. I don't know that it hits everybody right away, but when you realize it, you realize there's a definite Oedipal family, a traumatic family subtext happening, and, and, it and then speaks it becomes to, even richer. It, exactly. It becomes more interesting because a lot of times a filmmaker thinks, oh, well, if I don't explain it, then that's a flaw. It's not. It's if you if you explain something poorly, that's a flaw. But you're not required to explain everything. If if the mother and the father's role don't matter in the world of the film, then don't go to them. It doesn't matter. You don't have to, you know, a lot of, you'd be like cuz you could see a producer coming in and going, "Well, where are the parents? This doesn't make any sense. I need three scenes with the parents." And in some films, the other the director and the writer would go, "Okay, we'll write three scenes with the parents." In this case, thank God, nobody said that and nobody, you know, you don't need it in a film so steeped in, I guess, the nightmare logic that this film does. Yeah, that's it goes back to that nightmare slash dream logic. And, you know, even moments like on the beach where um, Jay is practicing shooting and, you know, she has that sort of quiet moment with Greg and we kind of get we get a sense of their backstory. But it's a really nice bit of, you know, 
Subtle. Scene where we don't have everything explained to death. Yeah. Now, I would love to get your take on the scene we're looking at right now. Jay wakes up on the hood of her car. She heads down to the water, sees three gentlemen in a boat, climbs into the water, and then we cut away to her going back to the house. Now, again, this is art, so there is no your answer is correct, but I would like to know what, what you take from that sequence. I see it as the moment, you know, that moment she's just totally exasperated. She, she's just lost Greg, who has sort of stepped into this role of, of you know, the protector. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so she's lost that protection. She's lost that security blanket. And now she's on her own, and she's stepping into the water. And, and she does, she's thinking about passing this on, you know, yeah. to these men that she sees out in the distance. But previously in the film, she had said, this is not something I want to do. Um so at that moment, she's just questioning everything, and she's ready to give up. But I read it that she doesn't. Yeah, I, and I think that to her, uh, again, the water, to use a simple symbol, the water is a, a yearning for a return to childhood. She's in the pool at the beginning. She's, you know, she's constantly submerging herself in water or getting soaked. And, you know, it it's maybe her yearning to go back to in infancy, you know, like, be back in the womb that's the beauty of it is a lot of directors or filmmakers are going well, we don't need this exact moment but if you keep it it creates a lot of cool questions and a lot of cool ideas so does the film need well who, who are we to decide what a film needs but if you're talking just about narrative structure no the film does not need this moment it's weird but I love it. <laughs> I think it's I do, too. The film is full of them, too. There's that moment, too, where the it first invades her house for the first time. You know, it's this huge moment for her, and it's terrifying. And one of the first things she does is ask for a glass of water. I don't know if you caught that. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. Oh, yeah. I, it's, her, it's her security. And now that now we're looking at the empty pool, and if we want to, uh, you know, uh, belabor our shared symbolism here... <laughs> That's the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the birth, the, the birth canal is, the water's broken. Her water, the, the, she has no water left to take sanctuary in anymore. And until yeah, Paul comes up, moment. until we come up to the pool. Um, and, and uh, yeah, what, what, what I mentioned early in the film is that there are lots of fun horror movies that we could go, oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, paranormal activity, that was sure was fun or uh, monster movie sure was fun, but we would not talk about them for 90 minutes and then I, I'll get on the phone after I'm done and talk to Drew or somebody else and talk for another hour because there's so much interesting stuff in the film. There's a lot and definitely upon repeated viewings, I caught a lot more too. That, Absolutely. Um, uh, I feel like it really grows with more, more viewings. Uh, yeah, and, and again, maybe we'll touch on this real quick because I don't want to be negative about it, but when... When you and I, when we see films at festivals and we review them and then there's eight, nine, whatever months goes by, uh, you kind of like you've been accused now of building up this lofty uh, overhype. And so when, you know, the film had come out and it got a, did really well in limited release and then it did really well when they opened it wider and then you inevitably get a handful of people who love it and then you inevitably get a handful of people who were not overwhelmed by it and they point to you as... You, you oversold this movie. And I'm, I watched this film my second and third time, and this is now my fourth time that I'm watching the film in total. I like you too. It plays like an album. I could watch it every week. There's not, I don't get, like, I don't care how much I love a film. I, you generally get tired of certain scenes, right? I have not gotten tired of any of the scenes in this film yet. I think that's because the film, again, you know, it really references that coming-of-age story and that narrative. And so almost every... Scene in the film is sort of another chapter in Jay's, you know, process of moving away from childhood and that struggle she's having moving toward adulthood. I think it really plays nicely um, for repeated viewings in that way. Right, right now we have heard Paul. Paul's taking her hand. He he's hatched this idea about the pool, and he's kind of semi in another movie. He'd be romancing her. He's getting out of the friend zone. And I asked Britt, and I'd like to ask you as well, from a woman's perspective, what does Paul represent to you? Is he harmless? Is he dangerous? Is he creepy or sweet? I think yeah. Paul's. Um, I, I think Paul has very teenage boy notions of what relationships are like. Still, um, he's also like all the other characters, sort of caught, caught in that space between, you know, young being young and being a young adult. 
And um, he sort of represented in the literary references throughout the film, like The Idiot, the book that Yara is reading throughout mm-hmm. the film, um, which is ultimately about the struggle between good and evil, even within ourselves. And so Paul does have those feelings of like wanting to be the good guy and wanting to be in the role of protecting her. But yeah, he struggles sort of with his sexual feelings too, which is referenced in that T.S. Eliot poem, poem that's read during the uh, classroom scene. Beautiful. About which is about this disillusioned kind of modern man who's dealing with his frustrations. And so Paul is really, he wants to be the good guy, but again, you know, it's a struggle for him, and I don't think it ever really is resolved. No, no, and it's still not resolved at the ending, which is, does childhood crush slash lust equal adult commitment? I don't think it does. It might feel good at the time, but, you know, I doubt that, like, forget the demon. If Jay and, and, and Paul and this movie together, that relationship lasts six months, max. <laughs> you know what I mean? Without the creature, they're like, they're friends who fell into bed together and learned to regret it. But Yeah, but- it's, it's like interesting. He sort of takes ownership over, over her. And again, that's a really, I think, teenage, teenage thing to feel. Like the world is really absolute. It's black and white. And you are mine or you are not mine. And she's sort of struggling, you know, to do her own thing like that's I think sort of why she turns to Greg because she wants to make that choice and Paul wants to make the choice for her because he has these still very immature notions of, uh, of what that relationship is we're looking is. at the creature on the roof who is it I have read it now that it is the grandfather okay I, I don't know who it is and I don't care I just love the shot <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a great shot uh, but uh, yeah you, we'll come as we'll notice later I didn't want to I don't want to spoil all the uh, creature appearances for the viewers because it might be more fun for them to figure them out on their own but I didn't know did you notice that the first time you saw the film that they they were characters I didn't I honestly didn't it's not something that I grasped with every single one, but then, again, I watched it more, and I said, oh, that's so-and-so, and it was, that was really a fun surprise for me. Before I uh, let you go and we move over to Eric, I know that why don't we talk about, real quick, the uh, the role of, now they're crossing over, quote-unquote, 8 Mile, which, if you're not familiar with Detroit, you could just uh, translate to mean, we're on the wrong side of the tracks now. We used to be in the suburbs, and now we're on the wrong side of the tracks in the in the urban sprawl of the city. So before I let you go, Allison, let, why don't we talk a bit about like the bubble that they live in, this suburban bubble uh, that gives them gives them almost almost a feeling of uh, imperviousness, almost a feeling of immortality. Yeah, they um, you know it's, he opens the film with this you know suburban scene, and it's not something it's not a picture that most of us have of Detroit. Most of us think of like an industrial wasteland, and I think that throughout the film. You know, he collapses those boundaries. Um, that theme of separation in the film, he sort of um, unites it near the end, where they do cross over to, the, you know, to the city. They're they're moving forward into this, you know, realm that's unknown to them. They really world, don't know yeah. this territory. Yeah. What's your take on the ending? Do you like the big? Uh, I know that it's kind of split people right down the middle. Some people who like the movie don't love the uh, the big pool finale. I think it's a great sequence. Frankly, I really liked it a lot, and um, I think that um, you know it, it ends in a way. I, I like the reference to, for me, I saw cat people, mm-hmm. um, which really is a movie about the power of suggestion, you know, the, the imagination, and so that scene for me is really beautiful. I think, even though it's also scary, obviously, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think it it leaves you know many questions, which is what he's done throughout the film. He's let us kind of fill in those blanks. Do you think that this plan would work in theory? Do you think it should work? That they could they could electrocute the thing? I I don't know how she didn't get electrocuted, but again, this is like a dream world. Yeah. So there's no logic there. Yeah, I, I think that the beauty of this is that it looks cool and, 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 and Mitchell plays it like they're all like organized and really know what they're doing. But if you really look about it, this is the most childish, silly plan they could possibly come up with. It's really, it's really admirable that they do it to help her, but it's like, and any adult would know that these items are not going to cause a large enough current to kill anything. It's not, that's not exactly how electricity works, but I mean, it's, I, I think it's there. The part of the naivete is what makes the scene so interesting. And I think some people who maybe don't like this sequence miss that it's, I, I think it's supposed to represent their naivete. It, it's 
does. And there's also, you know, I think what a lot of people are missing with this film, because there are so many great spooky parts, is that, you know, there's a lot of humor in this film. Mm. It's understated, but it's sprinkled throughout. Like, even in the opening with the girl running in high heels, which I'm so jealous of, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, that's just really amusing. And I, I believe he said he, he felt it was like something out of a De Palma film. And so, yeah, when they g gather at the pool and they kind of have these objects and it's very Scooby gang, you know, their yes, plan that Scooby -ish. doesn't quite very... work. A very Scooby plan, exactly. I don't buy for a second that it would work, but I love the idea. I love the teamwork. Uh, I love the execution, and the score in this whole sequence is so beautiful. Talk for I'm, I'm going to let you go. we got to get Eric, uh, but talk for a quick second about the score, please. I think that the synth in the film is really great. It's overpowering and invading and ominous, and it becomes its own character, sort of like the it. But what I'm really fascinated with is, um, you know, the the domestic life, the sounds of domestic life, and the way he treated um, ambient noises, like the slamming of doors and footsteps down the hall, and yes. he really creates his own language, his own oral language of fear. The general sound design in general, I agree, uh, is particularly great. As we look at a shot of the giant lightning shot over this pool facility, which is probably the most ominous shot in the whole movie. It feels like it fell out of hammer in 1948. Exactly. Uh, all right, Allison, I want to thank you so much for joining us. You guys have all been great, and you've been particularly great. And we're going to move over to our friend Eric Vespi. Tell our friends where they can find you on the Internet. You can find me on FlavorWire.com or talk to me on Twitter. Allison Nastasi. That's N uh, one L N A S N A S T A S I. Thanks, Allison. I'll talk to you soon, dear. Thanks, Scott. Bye. And we are now back with our fifth and final guest, Ain't It Cool's Eric Vespi, one of the most uh, established, well-rounded, articulate, knowledgeable movie geeks I know, and I know a lot. Eric, thank you so much for joining us, man. That's a hell of an intro, Scott. I'm totally not going to live up to that. Yes, you are. Uh, I think everybody would love to know that Eric is actually talking to us from New Zealand. He's visiting some friends uh, who are making some films out in New Zealand. And when I told him I would uh, like him to be on the commentary, he said, I will be in New Zealand, but I will definitely participate anyway. So, uh, hello to New yeah, Zealand. Yeah, I had to wake up like at 6 in the morning to do this, and that's like a huge deal for me, Scott. So that just shows you how much I respect you and appreciate this. And how much we love this freaking movie. If I were to uh, if I were to put a microphone right up in your face and I were to say, Eric, what are your favorite things about It Follows? What would your answer be? Uh, well, first and foremost, and the thing that hit me uh, the first time I watched it was just how... Uh, clear cut the mythology was and just how it's such a simple um, direct easily relatable and understandable uh, mythology you, um, I, I, I've described it as kind of the best easy to understand horror uh, uh, hook since the Nightmare on Elm Street you know where you fall asleep there's a guy in there he dies you don't have a choice you know in the matter you have to sleep so you know, you're always in danger. You know, it's very simple, very easy to understand. And in, in this one, having something that always uh, is there after you, you know, there's just this, this tone of dread yeah, that well, sits on the whole thing. No, no matter, you know, what you do, there's just nothing to escape it. And that's, you know, it, it's such a great, simple, you know, beautifully executed mythology. And that, that's what I, uh, uh, I love so much about the movie. What I like about it, I think you'd agree, is that while on one hand, it is remarkably straightforward, if you have sex, this thing will follow you until you pass it along and it will not stop. But beyond that, it also creates a whole lot of questions for people who love the movie to be like, well, wait, if you do this, would it ha would that matter? What if you have sex with an animal? What if you do this? What if you do, like, there are, like, with, they set up the rules in a, in a great set, in, a, in like you said, in a very efficient, uh, clever way, but it also leaves a lot open to your own interpretation. Well, and they don't over-explain the monster either. You don't know where where it comes from. You don't know, and you know that's the best part about it. The mystery, you know, it's the, the mystery is what uh, makes it scary, and that's what um, what I think David Robert Mitchell uh, really understands, and what a lot of horror filmmakers uh, or people who make horror films, not necessarily only horror films, but what a lot of people who make genre today don't don't grasp is that you don't have to explain every aspect of, of your threat yeah. and the actually the less you explain the, the scarier it can be so yep. I um, totally agree yeah, I mean don't explain it away what makes them creepy is the mystery 
Now, I could imagine that if in 25 years somebody says, oh, I'm going to remake It Follows, and now we have to have a full origin story for the demon and where it comes from and what inspires it, and that's not interesting. Mystery is interesting. Well, you, you, can't have, you can't have it both ways. What people want to do is they want to make the monster sympathetic, you know, and that's, you know, kind of the old universal monster route, which is amazing if you can pull it off, but they want to do that, and then they also want him to just be a regular old slasher. I threw a couple of names down here, and I thought that you would appreciate talking about these people. Uh, let's talk, throw out five adjectives for cinematographer Mike Julakis, who also shot John Dies at the End, incidentally. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, oh, geez. I think that uh, pr production value is a huge deal for me in, in films, and uh, especially genre, and I think it's so easy in, in horror to just simply get go for the scare and go for the jump scare and then like lean on your score to uh, you know to give you the sense of atmosphere you know and uh, you know it just in this day and age movies are made so cheaply they don't have time to shoot so you know they, they their days are uh, are the first thing to go off of uh, uh, you know on a low budget schedule mm -hmm. you know they, it's just getting getting the uh, uh, getting their days and they don't the artistry uh, leaves it but uh, uh, that is absolutely not the case in this movie, and the cinematography is, you know, just so good and so crucial to to that. That uh, it's complementary to that to that uh, uh, like sense of dread I was talking about with with the mythology. It, it works hand in hand with the story, and that, you know that's the only thing you could really ask for a cinematographer to do. I know I didn't give you that in five simple words. No, no, it's great. I love no, but you're right. Uh, one of our guests earlier touched on that very point: is that the the shadowy, moody cinematography lends itself directly to the the, the film's air of mystery and 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 uh, the unanswered questions and what what's in the shadows, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I did want to make sure before we got this commentary over with, we already threw some love to Bob Kurtzman. We should also uh, throw a lot of love toward production designer Michael Perry and art director. Joey Ostrander, because uh, it's one of the most strikingly visual, uh, visually striking films I've seen in a long time, and the fact that it is a low-budget film, but it is looks like, uh, metaphorically speaking, a million bucks. Um, can you speak on that, Eric, as a guy who has worked on films and has written and writes about films, that the intangibles that you can do in a film that don't necessarily cost a lot? No, I mean, nothing pulls you, or at least me anyway, out of a, a movie. And I see a whole lot of uh, movies at a film festival, low budget of all genres, no matter if it's a comedy or a horror movie or, you know, a, a romantic drama. It Nothing pulls you out of a movie than just yeah. bad production design. When you just go, when you see a, a house and there's just blank walls, yeah. you know, if you just see, you go, go to an office and it's like a, one chair and a desk, it's like there's... So much of a character of any film, if you think about any film that you love, uh, you know, and you think about any scene in that film, I can guarantee you that uh, it's going to have great production uh, uh, design, great team that will um, really make the details of the world feel real so you don't even think about it. And that, that's the reason why people don't appreciate them, I think, because when they do their job right, you don't. Yeah, you don't notice it. Suddenly, the world is just real. Yeah, and, and yeah. It, you know it's grounded, and, and it's not yet another 
layer of disbelief that you're asked, you know, you're asked to uh, suspend as a viewer. You know, another thing that happens a lot, a lot of things that happens a lot, Eric, is that like movies sometimes that take place because this kind of takes place in a 70s-ish dream world in a way. A lot of the fashions and a lot of the stuff is in the 70s or early 80s vibe. But a lot of times in movies like this, they overdo it. The bell bottoms are super wide and the headphones are super huge and the slang is super on the nose and it completely ruins the artifice. Subtlety is the way to go. Well, and, and it also makes the movie last. I can, you know, one of the things that I took away from It Follows was that there was a non-specific time and place, you know, that you just, it, in 10 years, it's not going to be, you know, the net, you know, when you watch the net now or something and, you know, just full of technology that's super outdated and yeah. and all that. So, it, you know, in, in many ways, you know, as, as there, there's a few really 80s things and uh, like A Nightmare on Elm Street, but still the main core of that, of that movie, you don't think of it as a goofy, campy 80s movie. No, no, and most I, of it know, is I timeless. Keep, yeah. Yeah, I hate to keep comparing It Follows to Nightmare on Elm Street, but that's, you know, the kind of direct... No, I, I don't think it's... Uh, I, I think it's uh, unavoidable, man. I think you're right. I, you're, and you're not the first person on this commentary to mention Nightmare on Elm Street in, in a different aspect than that, uh, both in the look and in the mythology and in the setup and in the character development. There's a lot of uh, clear inspiration uh, visually speaking, uh, from Carpenter, and thematically and character-wise from Wes Craven. They're, and all that tells me, and the fact that the film is so unique, it speaks to Mitchell's talent. Because if I tried to make a movie that homage Carpenter and Craven, it wouldn't be subtle. It would be... <laughs> one You'd get it in every scene. I would bang it over your head. So kudos to people who can take disparate influences and turn it into their own movie, right? No, and that's the trick, and that that's why a lot of genre fans revolt against the concept of remakes, because mostly it's just, you know, it's just lazy. What I, and, you know, what I would, you know, and I, and I don't hate remakes. I like a lot of them. The Blob, the Thing, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. There's a lot of really good genre remakes out there, but, you know, what I always hope for is that we have something more like It Follows, where you can have something that is clearly inspired by, you know, the great uh, genre films that happened beforehand uh, without just being a retread and that's you know you, you make something your own and you know suddenly you have you know the, the Magnificent Seven to the Seven Samurai you know you have two things that can co you know coexist that you know you have your own thing and uh, that's not even the you know that almost sounds like I'm saying that, <laughs> that this movie's you know, almost a remake of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, which it isn't, but uh, you know what I mean. I'm just talking about, like, the uh, influences and, and how that uh, uh, creates something new instead of just something that we feel like we've seen a million yeah, times before. Yeah, it's not, it's easy to be influenced. It's not easy to translate that influence into your own work. You know, uh, that, that, you know that to me is, uh, is what's so interesting about this film is that it clearly comes from a, a wide array of influences, but it is also remarkably original. And when we, I started the commentary by saying, you know, sometimes originality in horror films can be unnecessary. Horror, of, uh, more so than any other genre, I think that horror can pull a, pull a, get away with not being original. But then when something like this comes along, and it clearly has a few touchstones to other films, but it is a remarkably original film. That is what makes people like you and I and, and the people who've already seen the film so excited because it's new. It's like the Baba Duke. It's not something we've seen before. And while we might... And it, yeah. and it, it you go. No, I was going to say, and it takes, con it, it takes convention that we, that we already know and accept in genre like, you know, you, it's bad to have sex. You have sex and you die. You know, the very famous... Thing. It takes that, but it actually turns it on its head. You know, it's it's uh, it humanizes it in, in a way that uh, that most genre doesn't. You know, that they it, this isn't you know uh, a cheap you know schlocky movie. It's got it's got a lot going on. You know, on it on the surface and under the surface that you know I think is going to be you know one of the things that people. Uh, well, that'll make people keep revisiting it over the years, and, and uh, I know it's what I'm going to keep going back for. Is um, to we're going to wrap see up how, how those hold up. Uh, we'll wrap up with Eric in a second. I want to really quick. I want to thank uh, Eric Snyder, um, Britt Hayes, Sam Zimmerman, Allison Nastasi, and of course Eric Vespi. Uh, I want to thank Jeff and Baker Sound here in Philadelphia for uh, taking care of me again. 
And uh, thank you to Tom and everybody uh, at Radius for uh, letting me do this again. It's really flattering to, uh, you know, get me and my colleagues onto a Blu-ray and, and let us stay there forever. Uh, thank you to uh, David Robert Mitchell for uh, signing off on that. I, I double-checked with him, and he said, I'm psyched to hear it. So uh, when, when the director and the writer says, we're down for a bunch of rotten critics to write, talk about your film for 90 minutes, uh, we really appreciate that. Um, so thank you to all those people, and especially to anybody who bought the DVD or Blu-ray and is listening to it currently. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I want to let Eric have the final words. Um, Eric, why don't you talk about how do you think the, the why why do you think the film has struck such a chord uh, beyond its limited and now wide release? Why do you think it uh, it's it's struck an, it's stricken a chord with horror fans? Uh, it's pretty much what we've what we've just been talking about. It's got such a great uh, mythology that 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 hits you so dead center, and it's and there, there's such a great artistry in in how they uh, executed it. Like they actually cared, and you know, not just about how it looks, but you know, also uh, you know what the themes of the movie are, what the subtext of the movie is. It's 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 actually a, a legit. Uh, work of art and beautiful and I think that uh, <laughs> yeah and I think that's it work of art yeah it's the way to end it thank you Miss. thank you David Robert Mitchell and thank you everybody else goodbye